thank you for the invitation. So just, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So just before starting, because I know that I only have 25 minutes, something like this. So let me briefly introduce what's uh, the Computer Vision Center. It's in Barcelona. It's um, at the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. And we are more than 100 researchers. And there are different research lines. So one of the ideas, mobility, transportation, the cars are driving alone, and all this. Healthcare, medical image analysis, another one about industrial systems, and media content, and of course, document image analysis. And I think that's not necessary to explain why historical documents are important. So preservation, storage, accessibility. So that's why we focus our research. Someone could say it's only reading documents. I will just quickly show some of the applications that we could have, some of the different tasks. The first one, today in the morning, someone said microfilm, the, your, the original document is lost. I think that, that maybe you were, were talking about this. So in this case, we have microfilms, the document is lost, but it's not in a very good condition. So something that we would like to do is to clean a bit the document so that the readability is better. Another task would be analysis of the structure of the layout. So we could say that this is a graphic document, this is the graphic part, this is the text, these are, these are the lines, these are the words. I could go towards this transcription. Today in the morning people were talking about HDR and OCR. This is a typical task that we know. And of course, spotting. So I would like to search a symbol, a word, whatever kind of element. And then the idea is to go through the collection. No transcriptions in the collection, but I'm able to find where this element appears. So it can be an Arabic work, it can be a music score, it can be whatever. I would also like to go towards, instead of reading, I would like to analyze the, the, the style. So I could go and identify who is the writer, because I have these anonymous manuscripts, and I don't know who is the author. I could go towards signatures, if this is really the signature of that person. I could also go towards the evolution of handwriting. These are Bach manuscripts, and one of the questions is, is it in the earlies, in the lates of his life? So again, everything that I'm doing with text, I can also apply to other kind of manuscripts. It doesn't matter if it's a graphic do document, such as a music score, but it's okay. I could also work with photographs. So there are plenty of photographs, and I would like to know which is the description automatically. So the machine could learn, and then as soon as we have thousands of photographs, the machine could prepare some mini caption, or just saying which are the different tags that are in this image. All this is automatic. We could go in this way. Of course, we would like to go upper. So we, we would like to extract some more meaning. We could also find people, or we could also try to have some dating. I think that this picture, this photograph, is from the 50s. And, and this is why I decided to add this slide here. It's because it's related to one talk that we had uh, before lunch, which was the decryption of encoded documents. In this case, we have hidden messages in alphabets that we have never seen before. Because the idea was that I create my alphabet and then I communicate my secret message in war diplomacy between uh, the different priests. And then they were creating this alphabet. So everything that we see in reading a text, it's a problem here. And that's why we also work in this line. And now the idea is that I could try to have some more generic uh, HDR, which has never seen these documents. And this was presented in DATEC. In the morning, there was also some papers um, about this conference. So going back to the main purpose, and that's, that's why I think that it was interesting with crowdsourcing, is because we are creating the historical Facebook. 
And how we do this? So we take demographic documents, birth, marriage, death certificates, also local census, and we are extracting the information, linking all the data, and from this we have two different outcomes. The first is for citizens. I could have some storytelling. I could uh, see if I can have my, my, my ancestors appear here, the genealogical tree appears here, or I could also have this more research-oriented part because I would like to study uh, mobility, migration movements, or I could also have my uh, genealogical uh, tourism. There are some companies working on this. So how we did this? So we, we combined different research proje projects. The first one was European one on marriages, five centuries of marriages. So just extracting all this data and linking all people, we could have a very nice Facebook. And then also we also combined this with population documents, but in this case, local census. So we have in this house, these people living here. So how we did this? So we start with scanning, and then the interesting part is that from the image to the transcription, we have two options. So the machines read HDR, OCR, or crowdsourcing for transcription. Once we have all these, we can connect all data, and then from this we can explode all these. So the first option, and we already did this, we did different transcription platforms. So people were entering here, transcribing some of the information. It's really nice, but it takes time, and a lot of people are involved. That's why we go back, they were paid or not. So they were really doing this for a week, and then they were just you know, uh, losing the, in the interest. Was this exploitation or what? So now we, in parallel to the transcription <coughs> platform, we decided to explore the transcription of these manuscripts. Let me go back again to the centuries, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19th century. So the documents are not easy to read, even less for the machines, because a machine is seeing pixels. And pixels are just numbers. And the number is the brightness that we have, the contrast that we have in the document. So it's not, a, it's not a letter, it's just a number. So we are just trying to understand these numbers so that we can see what's written behind. That's why HTR and OCR is not so easy. So going to the transcription, they said, yeah, I would like you to take all these documents, transcribe the text, but I would like to extract the information which is different from transcription. I could say what's written in here, but I need, and this was the, the demographic point of view, I need to fill a database where I say that this person was married to that person, the parents, blah, 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 the origin was blah, blah, blah. So I have content. It's not just text as a narrative. So what we need here is name entities. So someone from uh, NLP, and I know that there are some people from NLP who say, let's go to the transcription, and then with this text, I go to my name entity recognition. And we said, hey, can we do all this together? So the first thing was to transcribe the text. And for this, we were using deep learning architectures. So we have the piece of text we are reading from left to right, and then from this we are extracting a set of uh, features using convolutional neural networks, which is this. And these features are analyzed in a sequence so that they can read, which is the character by character that appears in the image. So that was the transcription part. Of course, I need data to train this algorithm. But then concerning semantic recognition, we said, okay, let's do this name entity recognition. This is a name, this is a surname, this is an occupation, this is the place of origin. And of course, I would like to know which is the person it relates to. And in this case, what we decided to do is to create the semantic category language model. So we were analyzing all the different words, and the network was saying that, okay, after the name, it's very likely that appears a surname. And just because of this information, we were able 
to transcribe the document. So this is the input of the document that we have. And all this information that was crowdsourced first, now the system was doing this alone. And then someone says, hey, okay, but there are some errors. Yes, 90%, 92% accuracy. But again, this eight, nine, ten percent error is a problem. It's a problem because if I don't read correctly a surname, I'm linking this with other people that are not the good ones, so the correct ones. So now we said, come on, we, we need humans. Because in this case, data should be validated. And then something that we did, and that was our first trial, 70% of reduction time, was let's try to semi-interactively transcribe this. And since we know that searching is easier than transcribing, we know that the census documents uh, are more or less stable along the years. So people don't move and, and, and change the, the house every two years. So what we did is we read the document when we have the house, we have the people living in that house, we can check who was living in that house before. So the system could know if there are some variations. And this is what the system was doing automatically. So we select which is the document that we are trying to read. He checks, and in this house there were these people living. And I read automatically the document. I tried to search these names in here, and I could find all of them. Can you please tell me if I'm right or not? And then when you say yes, all these are here, automatically all this information is important. So 70% of the time is reduced because people that live in a house, the 70% of the cases, they still live in the house three, four years later. And that's why we did this. But is this enough? Mm, well, let's go a bit far away, and that's why the, the project Charches in Catalan, it means networks, uh, came. We have all the different documents. We would like to read these documents automatically, but here, instead of crowdsourcing, we would like to have some fun. So we are exploiting those people, they are slaves and they don't want to uh, transcribe because this is boring. And then we said, okay, why not having a game for this? Let's make video games. And then with these video games, we are validating that the transcription of the machine is correct. Then we are creating this social network, this historical Facebook, and from this we can have all the output. And for doing this, again, we know that there are many names and many surnames that appear very frequent. And what I mean this is that the 20% of the most common names and surnames appear the 80% the of the cases in the documents. John, Smith, Maria, all these names are very popular. So what we decided to do is we detect all the different words, we cluster all the different words, and all these Marias go together, all these Smiths go together, and then we try to transcribe all these at the same time. And for this, we have two games. We have the cluster game, so we show these words and the user says, yes, all these words look the same, they are all the same word. And then the second one is, yes, this word is John, yes, this word is Smith, or maybe not, it was, I don't know, another, another one. But the good thing of this is that the user is having fun. How we did this? So we take all words, we cluster them, we expand the labels to the neighbors so that we can have all the different variations. And from this, we use convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks for the transcription. So we have this input image, and the system says, probably Farré, but they, the, the other two could be also possible. So this is what we ask to the, to the user. So we show this word, and we say, can you confirm that the transcription is some of these? And this is what we, what we do. We have these two games. The first is for saying that all these words are, are the same. And the second one is for confirming that the transcription was good. So we did this with 40 different people. And we checked 
about the quality because it's, this is something that has appeared today in the morning sometimes. They are not experts, so their opinion might be right or wrong. So what about quality? So we ask different times, so the same word to different persons, and we also have golden task. The, the name golden task means that I know for sure which is the correct transcription. So I'm just checking if the user is randomly answering or he is really doing the job. So just because of this, we were analyzing. Here you, you see which were native or foreigner, depending whether you know the language or not. That was old Catalan. So that was, I, we, we had this native and foreigner. And we also asked some historians and paleographers to participate. What we saw in here, which is that uh, plot that we have there, is here we have the levels and here we have the errors. So the more we play, the less errors. That's why at the very beginning we need more golden tasks because we are learning and, and the user is, is learning how to play. But there is an interesting peak here in yellow, if you can see that, because the more we play, the more words we have and the more difficult they are to read. So the native speakers are okay, but the non-native speakers, the, the ones that they don't, are not familiar with the names and surnames um, in Catalonia, they start making a lot of errors. Frustration comes, and then they stop playing. And we were talking to them, and we said, why, why did you stop? And in most cases, is I got frustrated, I couldn't reach the next level, and after three, four trials, I decided to give it up. So this is really important, so how, how the users should be. And another thing that uh, especially the old ones complain is the time is down. So the closer I am to the end of the, of the one minute that I have for playing this level, the more stressed I feel and the quicker, the quicker I answer. So more errors again. So we have here the different numbers for uh, the correct transcriptions that we have. Of course, more people playing, more answers, and better for the transcription the, and the validation. And we still can live with 90, 100% of validation. And of course, with these ideas, we keep on improving, and that's why we have these two new games. One without time penalization, and the other one, a bit more fun, where you have to jump the different words, was just like Mario Bros, something like this. So this is what we are doing, and it's still complicated, because they, they must have fun, but at the same time, if they are too stressed about the time, the, the countdown, then they start answering in a, an incorrect way, and this is not what we want. So concerning citizen participation, I will go what, quite fast in this. We had 150 transcribers for the marriage project. We have around 120 for the census. And this is just a matter of going there, going to the different neighborhoods, explaining the project, and then asking them if they want to participate. This is a tedious task, because it means that we are going there and we are explaining the project to many different places. But in here, the archivists for each one of the towns are very active in the sense that they know the neighborhood and then they attract people. And then the second part which is interesting is the library living lab. It's an open space in a public library where researchers can try, test and try, test and try, and the citizen is in the loop the whole time. So the innovation is together with the user from the very beginning. So we also had many different uh, prototypes which were <coughs> tested in here. So we have this network. Are we exploiting the users just having their time and not giving anything back? No. So the idea is that they can browse all this. So they have this website, it's, it's in here, and then we can see the genealogical trees, we can also see uh, the migration movements, people can also upload 
photographs. So this is an application that we have in the mobile, so you can take a picture. Someone said, via WhatsApp, someone could, could send uh, the, the photos. Yes, we have, a, we have a, an application in the mobile where I can say, hey, this is my grand-grand-grandfather. I can take a picture of, the, of him and I can upload it in here. And another thing that we did was Wikipedia. Today in the morning, someone was talking about Wikipedia and Wikidata. So in this case, we wanted to historically contextualize our network. So that was the, uh, the, the historical, the historical uh, time period. So I would like to know what happened at that time. If there is also some information about this person, because he was uh, famous, I could also have some information about the place. So I'm somehow enriching with information that I have for free just by linking this data to Wikimedia, Wikidata, and Wikipedia. And the next step is, okay, in addition to the documents, I can also have, we were discussing about the private let letters. Yes, we also have this possibility. Just imagine that in addition to the genealogical tree that I have, I also have my documents at home. My grand-grand-grandparent, this is uh, his document, this is his picture, so I can also upload all this and enrich all together. So, in this case, the citizens are helping with the games, with the crowdsourcing platform. They are also validating data, so it's possible to say, hey, this marriage is not correct. This is the same person, but I'm pretty sure that this is not my grand-grandmother. So this is also something that the user can also say, validation of the transcription, validation of the linkage. And in the end, what we have is a project with three pillars from the digital humanities researchers, which means computer scientists and demographers, the humanities. We also have archives and public administration involvement. And we also have the citizen participation. And with these three pillars, we are just trying to grow up. And what's the future? I still have one minute, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So what's the future? I don't know if you, you have heard of this initiative. The Time Machine is the flagship that's being prepared. Right now, the CSA project has been granted. The first one among all the grantees. And it's a very ambitious project because we aim to create the time machine. So virtually, of course, we don't really go back in time. But it means connecting everything. And we are right now more than 200 partners, 33 different countries. And it's very ambitious in the sense that everything should be linked. I have music scores, I have maps, I have letters, I have demographic documents, I have whatever. Everything should be integrated so that we can later visualize all this information. This started with a local time machine, the Venice time machine. So they extracted all the information, they linked all data, and then they created some visualization tools. So that's why they have this mini uh, time machine. 1,000 years, this is not a joke, 1,000 years, and it's already been done. And now this initiative is being expanded. And, of course, there are some others. Amsterdam, I, uh, 10 days ago I was in Amsterdam just to see how the Amsterdam time machine was going on. But you can see that Jerusalem is also here, and we are creating right now the Barcelona time machine. So we are starting moving this. And how we aim to do this? Instead of three, we aim to have four pillars. So we have researchers, we have the public administration, the archives, the libraries involved. We also have society citizens and companies. So there are some companies already in the Time Machine project because they are creating video games, Ubisoft. I don't know if someone of you knows Ubisoft and Assassin's Creed or something mm -hmm. like this. Okay, so they are creating video games and they have the killing part and the educational part. Mm -hmm. And they, they also said that in the educational part, there is no invention. Everything that appears there has been documented by a historian. So there are no narrative inventions in this, in this part. And there are also tourism uh, companies that could create these cultural uh, travels, trips and tours. 
So it's just a matter of having these four pillars together so that all these ambitious uh, projects can go ahead. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, how much participation have you had by the public in like the, the slaughter project that you're talking about? Um, the one about the marriage records, it was about 150. The one about the census is around 120. Mm -hmm. And the video games, around 40. And the one so with the gamification? What? The one. Is that the one with the game of Yes, patient? with the games, yeah. 40, and around that, 40. And is that because you're testing it? What? More, is that because you're testing it yes, as a project course. more than, yes. this is a, a big project we want to do it on? Yes, we are We are still testing this because the first, uh, because this is something that you already, you, we have a crowdsourcing platform, but then you, you should see if users are really yeah, using yeah. this, and then they suggest uh, improvements. So in this case, we had these first games, and I think that it's these two games. So they were, uh, some of them, because this is something that we asked, we were complaining that it's very stressing to have a countdown, because the time here yeah, reaches yeah, yeah. zero, and then I'm super stressed. Some mm -hmm. others, especially the young ones, like said that. it's not fun enough. So we were having all this feedback, and that's why we are starting with these two, because it's, it's curious, the games that teenagers play are different from the games that pensionists play. So now we are having different variants. Mm -hmm. Here the time is not uh, playing at all. In here you have words that are coming and then you are jumping. If you are too slow, you are losing some, some words. So mm -hmm. this is stressing for teenagers. This is for pensionists, let's say. So and this is why we are still learning. And probably after playing with this, we will have a third version of the of the game. So that's well, you you can download these games if you go to the website. You can already download the games. I already have it in my in my phone. But this is not a super great because we are still you know creating these prototypes. And this is why the the library living lab helps because we have some events at the library living lab. People come, people play, and people propose improvements. And this is why. Even the user feels more, let's say, like like participation, Some ownership not exploitation. Like it's yeah. I'm together and I'm suggesting things. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you for a very fascinating presentation. A wide range of computational approaches. I felt that you described them very clearly. Help me understand the kinds of things you were doing. So I'm going to ask a question that's humanistic in nature to challenge an assumption I heard you you say, yep. and see what, what how it makes you respond, and, and see if you think there may be some some validity to it. Do you think that a time machine in which everything is linked is more historically accurate than a time machine in which everything is not necessarily linked? Yeah, and I would I would also ask a different question. Do you think that the country that links the data will make a difference. I mean, can I choose? Because I remember that um, in Japan, some some people were complaining because the textbooks in Japan were explaining the Second World War in a very different way. So you can you have the same data, but you can interpret the data uh, as you prefer. So that's that's why all these you know linking data makes makes a bit complicated. And one of the things that they were also discussing here is how to link data, avoiding any bias. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that possible? Is that possible? Yeah. Like, there's always bias. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I that's don't know like, if it's possible, <laughs> but if you join the time machine, and I think that Jerusalem is already there. Someone yeah. in Jerusalem, yes. because it's already there. there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So yeah, we are the representatives. So in in the meeting, so ten days ago there was a meeting in Amsterdam, and I remember the humanists uh, discussing about how to do this in the more let's say objective way. And I don't think that there is a one solution. Well, and I think it may be more historically realistic to describe the way in which things linked as sometimes representing separation. Things can be linked by a lack of a link, right? Because that's human nature. We don't have, yes. you can't always get there from here. 
I think that it would be nice to have different possible linkings. And then you could analyze the different ones and then discuss. And I think that just because of this, you could fill you know, a whole room discussing that this was like this. Now, maybe that other interpretation and linkage was more useful. But this is your part, you see. <laughs> Uh, two questions. One is almost administrative. Uh, you're doing the research, but how? who is managing all this community engagement activity? Mm. This is first. And second is, to what extent what you've just presented is already available for us to download it in GitHub and do the Israeli version of it? Mm. Uh, well, the first about the administration, it means that I'm working in, in, the, in the part of the computers, right? Yeah. And uh, the demographer is working on the interpretation of data, saying which num names should be linked, which is the best way to interpret the data so that we are also doing the record linkage. And they, in any case, are validating all this uh, linkage later. So we are um, understanding how they use the data, and then we are creating the tools. But we are not substituting the humanist. And this is one discussion that we always have in the Digital Humanities Conferences. Hey, they are coming here. No, no, no. We are collaborating. OK, so the thing is that uh, we are doing all this work, and we are in touch with the different archives in the different towns. I, yes the different archives in the different towns. And they are the ones who are uh, having these Twitter, Facebook, websites, mm -hmm. announcements. They know people. They also announce that there will be a session in the local, local uh, newspaper. And they so are the ones that move people. Hmm. I mean, we don't have the time of doing all this. Yeah, but you already said that. You you also go to the to the synagogues, yes, and then I you mean, explain that. No, but so far we're doing it as like a team of us as an academic institution, and that's uh, and we okay. find it challenging. Yes, yeah? let's let's see it in a in a different way. All the different synagogues would like to invite you, let's say, invite you one day per month yeah. to explain the project, and then they already they are the ones that are gathering, engaging people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's the issue which is still for us a task. How yeah. to find those, uh, to make it a kind of a process, like, that, like the influence, which is not only things which are activated by, by us, but just let, making it yes. a process, yeah. yeah, a social process. Yes. Uh. We'll continue at dinner. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.